menopause, Let's Talk Menopause is a national nonprofit devoted to changing the conversation about menopause so women get the information they need and the health care they deserve. Um, I want to emphasize that all of our menopause talks are for information purposes only. So if to get medical advice, please seek help from a medical practitioner or your doctor. Um, and um, uh, just a few housekeeping items before we begin. We have disabled the chat. So we want you to uh, pose your questions in the question and answer section. Um, we will be using the chat to send you different links that are relevant uh, to the talk. And so post your questions and we will try to get to as many of them as we possibly can. Um, and at the end, we're gonna have a very brief poll. And so we want everyone to fill it out so that um, you can uh, you know, help shape our future menopause talks. Again, you can look at the chat for links about Let's Talk Menopause, about our speakers and about other relevant research and pose your questions in the questions and answers. So I'm gonna begin by interviewing, introducing Dr. Susan Goldstein, who will be interviewing Dr. Claudio Suarez. And so we're thrilled to have both of you today. Um, so Dr. Goldstein, they're both Canadian, and Dr. Goldstein is a community-based family physician who practices both primary care and psychotherapy. She's also assistant professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto, and she has a special interest in women's health. She is on the board, a board member of the Canadian Menopause Society and a certified menopause practitioner. She has also developed a menopause assessment tool, the Menopause Quick Six, MQ6, which we will put a link in the chat with an accompanying treatment algorithm and it, which can be found at mq6.ca for Canada. And this is a really important um, project because it's designed to help both physicians and women better understand the symptoms they're experiencing and what treatments they can uh, turn to. Uh, I just wanna say one other thing, we're particularly thrilled by this menopause talk. Dr. Suarez, um, the kind of research he does on depression and mood challenges in midlife, perimenopause and menopause is so critical. It's just the kind of information we need, women need all over the world to understand what to expect during this time and what treatments can promise the best effectiveness for women who may be struggling during this period. So now I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Goldstein, and thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm quite excited to be here for a number of reasons. First of all, Dr. Suarez is really an international expert on this topic and uh, my good colleague and friend. And it's lovely for us Canadians to be able to speak to everyone across the U.S. as well. Um, and as a primary care provider and someone who works in mental health, you know, mental health issues are just so important and not as well understood, particularly for this vulnerable population that is perimenopausal and menopausal women. So quick introduction. Dr. Suarez is a professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry at Queen's University in Canada, treasurer and member of the Board of Trustees for the North American Menopause. Somehow I got muted. <laughs> okay, where where did it, did I start my intro or? Yeah, you were on the names, but maybe it was, oh, maybe it was a sign you keep it short. <laughs> All right, well, it's a quick one. So Dr. Suarez is focused on novel treatments for midlife women with all kinds of mood and sleep issues. He's interested in applying digital health technologies for treatment monitoring and relapse prevention and a sought out a, a sought after educator, more, more than 200 presentations, numerous grants and awards. And I can't not mention this, you won the 2019 North American Menopause Society, Thomas Clarkson Award for Outstanding Research. And thrilled to be in a conversation with you today, Dr. Suarez, we're gonna get to it. Don't know what happened with the muting. Um, so let's start by setting the stage here a little bit and just talk a bit about risk and prevention. It's interesting that in menopause, not all women suffer, 
Some women do. Some women are more likely than others to experience depression during the perimenopause or menopausal transition. Could you speak to that? Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Suzanne, for being here. It's a pleasure to share this session with you. I want to also thank uh, Jessica and Donna and Let's Talk Menopause to give us an opportunity to talk to this audience. Um, uh, menopause has been my it's very dear to my heart has been the area of a clinic and research work that I have been doing for the past 20, 20 plus years. Um, and one thing that I think it's even in the, in the, in the title of the talk, right? If it's not in your head, I think as people are still struggling to understand, you know, is this something that all women or some women will face? And if it's real, uh, it's real for whom? Like who are the ones who might be more likely or less likely to to face depression or depressive symptoms. And we're gonna be talking about depression and depressive symptoms as well. But I think it's one thing it's important to keep in mind is that uh, most women will not have depression during menopause. And I think that's kind of important to set the stage. So we're not talking about, you know, 60, 80, 90% of it. Uh, probably when you start looking at depressive symptoms, having some symptoms of anxiety and, and some low mood, it's probably the numbers are a little bit higher. But when we think about clinical depression and the depression that really affects someone's functioning, um, it's really different. And I think, uh, thank you, uh, Donna and Jessica for putting this slide. So I think one thing that we, it's important for us to keep in mind is that overall across the lifespan, right? From, from puberty all the way to menopause and beyond, women are more likely to have depression than men. And at any given point, that risk is about I'll say around two-fold increased risk for women, twice as, as much as a high risk for depression in women compared to men. And it happens more during the reproductive years. So when we look at young girls before puberty or before menarche, their first menstruation, or older women uh, in their 80s and 90s, the, the proportion between men and women for depression is very similar. It's one-on-one, -on -one, close to one-on-one. -on -one. But between the ages of 12 to 50 or 55, up to 60, the risk is higher. So that's the first clue that it, it might have to be something to do with the, that period of the time when we were exposed to what? Hormonal changes, right? From the menarche all the way to menopause and beyond. So they are exposed to hormonal changes. And that might be one of the reasons why we might have more risk for depression in general, but definitely more risk for depression around the time of menopause. And what we're going to be discussing today is those two ideas that maybe there are some windows of risk or windows of vulnerability during which women might be or some women might be high risk for depression uh, and we we know at least three windows i could probably include a fourth window here which is menarche when girls are having their first menstruation so that time can be very tricky uh, we all know that Everybody who had adolescents or preteens and teens know that can be a challenging time for many different reasons, but also including the exposure to hormonal changes. And the other ones are the premenstrual phases or premenstrual uh, syndromes for some women or, or the MDD, the premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Perinatal postpartum can be also tricky for some women to develop the blues or severe blues uh, or even depression. And, and then a menopausal transition. So there's something about those windows that put some women, but not all women, at high risk. So one clue here is that we know that once more vulnerable to hormonal changes, always more vulnerable to hormonal changes. So women who had a history of being more sensitive to hormonal changes are more likely to experience depression during the menopausal transition. The flip side of that is that there's an opportunity for us to treat the treatment for depression. So on one hand, women are more likely to have depression more exposed to have depression and more likely to have depression during hormonal changes. On the other hand, that creates an opportunity for us to develop and, and tailor treatments for women the way that we cannot tailor for men. So men have depression across the lifespan, but they are not as, as vulnerable to hormonal changes like women can be. So although men may have hormonal changes during the during the andropause, right? So when they are transitioning to low testosterone levels, they are not as sensitive to hormonal changes as women can be. So we cannot really tailor the treatment for depression men the same way that we can tailor the treatment for, for women. So one thing that when you ask me, so who might be a higher risk for depression and who are those? 
one way to look at it is look at those two buckets of uh, risk factors, right, that we have in that slide. Uh, and one on the left-hand side of the slide that I'm looking at, so we have what we call continuum-related factors. So these are factors that will follow a woman throughout her life. So it basically things that happened to you in the past and you carry on, and they will be your, for the lack of better terms, your, your emotional baggage, so that things that you're carrying with you that make you more vulnerable to develop depression at the time when you can be more vulnerable. So the other example, for instance, when you think about medical conditions, right? So diabetes, you might have a predisposition for diabetes. You might have a genetic predisposition. Uh, maybe you had a, a, you know, some other risk factors, including your diets and your exercise or your lack thereof throughout your life. But then at some point in life, you buy more vulnerable to develop diabetes. And all those risk factors that have been following you throughout your life might be compounding to increase your risk. So it's similar here. So women who had a childhood trauma, early exposure to traumatic events, right? Emotional neglect, abuse, sometimes sexual abuse. They're more likely to have depression in general. But the studies are showing that they're also more likely to develop depression during the menopause transition. So there's something about a biological scar that carries on with trauma that increases the risk for some women to have depression. There's actually studies showing that trauma, early, early, early childhood trauma, also increase, increase the risk for cognitive changes during menopause. So women who have more uh, cognitive changes, uh, working memory deficits or, or challenges, more kind of a brain fog than menopause. Uh, those who have trauma in the past have a high risk for, for cognitive changes. History of depression, anxiety, being from uh, less favorable socioeconomic factors, having chronic health issues. So these are long standing risk factors that once the women hit the menopause or the menopausal transition, they might have a higher risk. The other bucket of risk factors is the, the more the context related ones. They're more specific to that window. So when women are start having hormonal changes, irregular cycles, hot flashes, so those that are very circumscribed to that time, they can also trigger depression. So either or or both, right? So the windows related the window related factors are the most important one is the hormonal change itself, right? the hormonal changes that are happening during the menopausal transition are probably one of the most potent triggers for depression during that time. One thing is important to highlight here is that it's not about how much or how little hormones you have, it's about the chaotic fluctuation that you have. So what we know is that during the time when women are transitioning to uh, menopause, what we call the menopausal transition, or early postmenopausal years, they are exposed to chaotic hormonal changes. So estrogen goes up and go down. Progesterone also varies. And during that time, they also have all the menopausal related symptoms, right? The vasomotor symptoms, the hot flashes, the sleep, etc. So during that time, there's a greater fluctuation of estrogen, and that is creating a higher risk for depression. That's the window of vulnerability. If you remember the slide before, it talks about the wind of opportunity. So how can we leverage the fact that we learn about that vulnerability? How can we mitigate that risk? How can we reduce that risk? One thing that we learned over the years is that if we reduce the hormonal change, the noise that is caused by the hormonal changes, we can reduce the risk for depression. We didn't learn that from menopausal population. We learned that from PMDD. So we learned that um, you probably know, Susie know well, and probably some of the, the attendees in the, in, the, in the talk today, the chat that we have, they know that sometimes women have severe PMS, huh? the menstrual symptoms, and they have moody and dysphoria, and then they go on OCs, oral contraceptives, and if they take the oral contraceptives on a continuous fashion, they don't have PMS anymore, right? right? So what is happening there is that we are, we are tricking the system, right? So we are, we are sending a signal to the body that the hormonal changes are not more there because you're keeping the hormonal levels stable. So we reduce the ups and downs, and by reducing that, they improve their PMS. The same thing happens in the menopausal population. So when women receive hormonal therapy, some, not all, but when they receive hormonal therapy, so that sends a signal to the body that the ups and downs are under control. 
So whatever was actually affected by these unstable estrogen levels and all the other hormonal changes, so it becomes more stable when women go on hormone therapy, and that reduces their risk for depression, or in some cases, even treat depression. So there's an opportunity to, once you know that hormonal changes can be tricky for some women, to reduce that, that risk by mitigating the hormonal changes and then using some cases hormonal therapies for that. So there are the long-standing risk factors that we know that some women might be more likely to have depression, and there are the window-related factors. They're more specific to that context, primarily hormonal changes, but also vasomotor symptoms and sleep problems. So now we hear all this, and I'm sure all of our women listeners are thinking, oh goodness, how lovely that we have all of these vulnerabilities that just put us at a bit of higher risk. Um, but it's a great way of explaining it. So we have some sense of how the interplay acts between the hormones and all of these other factors. I'm sure our listeners are wondering if there's anything they could do to protect themselves from mood disorders that might arise, because we do know that not only do we see a reemergence of depressive symptoms in perimenopausal women, but we'll see first episodes of depressive symptoms for some. So are there any preventive measures that women can take? So that's a, that's a great point that you actually raised, uh, Susan, that the strongest risk factor for depression and menopause is having depression before, right? So, so when we talk about all those risk factors, nothing trumps more uh, history of depression as a, as a risk factor. Why is that? Well, because you're then combining a predisposition to have depression plus the vulnerability of the window, right, of the perimenopausal transition. So those two factors for some women can be can be quite tricky in terms of increasing their risk for, for depression. So one thing that you mentioned before, uh, that when we're discussing all the risk factors, is to really be aware of those and to have a, a, a good, um, broad conversation with your patients. So if you know, and if you, for instance, if you're a family doctor, you're following that patient, and you know that patient very well, and you know that patient has a history of trauma or history of depression, anxiety, and now she's coming to your office, she's perimenopausal, she's having you know, irregular cycles, she's not sleeping well, and she's complaining about mood symptoms, don't really minimize those symptoms, because you know, based on her history, that she's more likely to develop depression as opposed to other women who never had those risk factors. The other thing that we know that increased the risk for depression, there are now several studies that show that prospectively. So they follow women before they are perimenopausal, and then they look at risk factors. One thing is actually the, the presence of hot flashes. So when women are complaining about perimenopause and having significant hot flashes and not sleeping well, both sleep disturbance and hot flashes are also predictive factors of depression. So if you think about the screening for depression, so having hormonal changes, having history of trauma or anxiety, but also complaining about severe and bothersome hot flashes. So it is a strong signal for a potential risk for depression. That's why when we talk about treatments of depression, we have to think about treating the patient as a whole. So we're looking at all the potential symptoms that are contributing to a poor functioning and poor quality of life and knowing uh, that the patient is affected by hot flashes and sleep problems it would be not only a risk factor for depression, but also important to keep in mind when you design the best treatment option for that patient. That's so helpful. Thank you. I just want to flip that for 10 seconds and just remind the listeners that, yes, primary care providers really need to be sensitive to if you have a patient that has had a history but of depression that they are at higher risk. But I think the, there are a lot of knowledge gaps in the menopausal world. So what can women do to empower themselves? If you know that you've had mood issues, you can go to your primary care provider during your physical and just say, do we need to keep an eye on my mood? During the, when I start to hit uh, perimenopause and when I start to lose my periods or have symptoms, and you can be the initiator of that. And that's a bit of insurance that you can throw in. So thanks for that. We're going to move on to treatment because I'm sure um, our listeners really want to know about how we treat depression with our perimenopausal menopausal patients and if that differs in some way to treatment at other times in life. So the answer is yes. So you do have a specific uh, treatment strategies for depression and perimenopause, and that's probably something good because I 
I hope that at some point we get to the level in mental health that we can tailor treatments for all conditions that we have. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for psychiatry or mental health in general, for many, many years, we had a one size fits all, right? And we have patients, which is very different than we do in cardiology or when we treat asthma and diabetes and other conditions, we really tailor the treatment to patients that we use two or three different drugs with different mechanisms of actions. But for many years, surprising or not for some uh, women are not, not even including clinical trials the clinical trials were all done in men and then we are kind of extrapolate the information from the clinical trials to the female population so we are way probably uh, way better than we used to be uh, and a good example is the CAMAT guidelines they are now being revisited and we're probably going to have a 2023 version very soon but this is the latest version that we have of the CAMAT guidelines. So these are the Canadian that work for mood and anxiety treatments. Uh, there's, a, there's a group in Canada called CAMAT, which is really dedicated to create guidelines and standards of care for mental illness. Uh, and they published a, a section in 2016 specifically um, designed to help to treat depression during the perimenopausal period. Why is that? Because there was really a lot of interest in tailoring the treatment for that population because that population has a high risk, right? And so we're trying to find what was more effective, but also well tolerated and more user friendly for, for patients and physicians and their families. So what you're looking at again lines here is first line treatment, second line treatment, third line treatment. And when we look at levels of evidence. It's really based on the, the strength of the data that was driving that decision. So level one, uh, it's really, can you go back just uh, one second on this? So level one is really when you have robust data, like well-designed clinical trials. Level two is like smaller clinical trials, maybe just meta-analysis. You put all these studies together, you're trying to figure it all, come up with the results. Level three is like smaller studies, sometimes studies that didn't use placebo, like what we call open-label trials. And then level four is more clinical experience, like physicians have used that medication for many years or have tried new treatments. But the level of evidence is not as strong as level one, two, and three. So based on that, you can see that the only level one that we have in that in, in that uh, guidelines back in 2016 is dazonafaxine. So dazonafaxine is an antidepressant that is called SNRI because it's working more in norepinephrine in your brain and serotonin, one of those two chemicals together with dopamine. So why dazonafaxine, uh, which is also known, one of the trade names is Pristique. Why is Pristique the first line? Well, it just happened to be a molecule that was developed at the time when there was a great interest in depression and perimenopause. And they were also studying the same molecule for hot flashes. So the company was developing the molecule, really designed, well-designed studies to assess depression and show that dazonafaxine worked very well for depression. But you can also look at um, all the other treatments that have some evidence. So cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, it's not a medication, it's a psychological treatment, but it has very strong evidence, it's level two, uh, to treat depression in the population. And then you have, in the second line, estradiol. So estradiol provided transdermally, so patches or gel, shown to really treat depression almost at the same level of efficacy as antidepressant. It's level two because we have smaller studies and fewer studies looking at estrogen, but the signal that we get from studies is as potent, as, as strong as we get with antidepressants. And if you go to the list, you're gonna have a lot of a level three, a lot of antidepressants that we use, you know, Lexapro, Cymbalta, uh, citalopram, Remeron, Mirtazapine, Quetiapine, Seroquel, uh, Venlafaxine, Effexor, uh, Fluoxetine, Prozac, uh, Paxil, Zoloft, all the antidepressants have some data showing that they can be very helpful for depression. Then down the list, mindfulness, CBT. Why is that? Back in 2016, it was not as popular as it is now. Probably the studies now will show a little bit of a stronger signal for mindfulness, can be very helpful, particularly for patients with depression and anxiety. But that shows the breadth of treatments that we have. So it's not like you have to use one medication versus the others. And we're gonna be talking about that in the next slide. But it just shows that there is some evidence for you to guide your decisions, either as a patient or as a physician, on what to try, maybe what to try first and what to try next. Okay, so this is actually coming from um, 
a paper that we published a few years ago uh, together with Dr. Shea Allison, looking at some of the evidence-based treatments for menopausal related depression, right? So first, so in, in here in the slide, different than the CAMA guidelines, what, I, what we did, we broke down by first episode versus recurring episode. Because that's, that's very important to think about because when we talk about recurring episodes, so let's start from the, the bottom of the slide. So if a patient responded well, let's say to Zoloft or Prozac or, or Pistique in the past, there's no reason for you to try something new because she's more likely to respond to an antidepressant that she responded well in the past. Conversely, if she didn't respond to, let's say, Prozac in the past, there's nothing unique about depression and perimenopause that make her more likely to respond to Prozac this time. So you shouldn't try something that failed to respond in the past. So the first rule will be, you know, if something worked very well in the past, should be your first option, unless there's a reason for you to think about something else. And it's usually not efficacy related, it's more tolerability or side effect related. So let's say in the past, you are in your 20s or 30s, you had depression and you responded to Paxil and responded beautifully to Proxetine. But we know that Proxetine causes weight gain, more sexual dysfunction, and in some cases cause dry mouth. Now, now, 20, 30 years later, you're depressed and you go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, I was, you responded to Paxil in the past, let's try Paxil again. You might say, wait a minute, do I have any other options? Because I don't wanna gain weight, I don't wanna have sexual dysfunction, and I would rather try something different. So that's totally reasonable to try something different in that case. So just keep in mind that efficacy and tolerability would be important. But then goes to a first depressive episode. So you never had depression in the past, so you don't have a history of responding or non-responding to medication. So then you have all the options that are listed here. So you could try psychotherapy first, you could try cognitive behavior therapy to deal with those automatic thoughts or distortions that you have about yourself or the situations around you. CBT is proven to be very effective, right? And if you have access to CBT, now we have CBT online. There are a lot of uh, services that provide or broaden the offer of CBT. Um, but if you wanna try medications or if you need to try medications, you have all those SSRIs or SNRIs or others that are listed here. They have studies shown efficacy. Remember, desvanafaxine is the one that has more evidence, but all the other antidepressants that are listed here have some evidence of benefits. So you really have, so it's, a, it's a, the blessing and the curse. The blessing is you have a, a dozen options. The curse is that you have a dozen options and you have to figure out which one's gonna work, right? It's that between you and your physician uh, to look at all the safety and tolerability and efficacy data and then choose what is probably best for you to try first in your particular case. Excellent. Um, I think there's... Yeah, so so the next slide, I think that Jessica was just sharing the second mm -hmm. slide on uh, the treatment. So maybe we can spend a little bit more time discussing that. So we, we touched on... We, we touched on I'm just one. wondering, Claudio. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but as we're going through, there is a question in, in the chat, and I just wanted to help maybe as we go through, clarify if there's a difference between treating the women who are perimenopausal, who are at the greatest risk of depression symptoms and, and postmenopausal. So if you can just highlight if you would do something different as we go through. Absolutely. And, I, and that's, that's the perfect segue for that slide. So so let's go back one, one step on the treatment of depression, the perimenopausal and early postmenopausal years. That's when the, the window of risk is the, is, the, is the greatest, right? So we're talking about when we, we, we're thinking about using an antidepressant for the first time or considering different antidepressants, you think about efficacy, safety, and tolerability. So there are other things for you, for you also to keep in mind, right? So we talk about you know, the side effect profile, the impact on weight or sexual dysfunction. But the safety uh, component here is very important. So going back to the example that we we're discussing before, right? So you had depression in your 20s or 30s and you use paroxetine and you did very well on paroxetine. Now you're in your, in your 50s and, and you have depression, but you also happen to have breast cancer, right? And you are put on tamoxifen for, for, for breast cancer as part of your treatment. And now you went to your, your family doctor and 
and then you discuss with your oncologist and you, you're thinking about treating your depression. So one could say, well, let's use paroxetine that used in the past uh, because it worked well. Well, paroxetine actually in inhibits the, the effects of tamoxifen, makes tamoxifen less, less efficacious and less safe to be used, right? So basically affects the ability of tamoxifen to work in your body and supposed to do to reduce the risk for breast cancer recurrence. So you have to think about drug-drug interactions more carefully during that time because during the menopause years, that's when a lot of the medical conditions are emerging or when they're more likely to be on two or three more medications than they were in their 20s, right? So think about safety as a, a drug-drug interaction is important. We discussed the tolerability uh, factor, but also the impact on menopause-related symptoms. So the difference, for instance, in, between perimenopausal and late postmenopausal years, one of the differences is that during that time, you might have more frequent and more severe hot flashes and night sweats. And you're also more likely to have more sleep problems. And the sleep problems that you have in the perimenopause are usually what we call broken sleep or disrupted sleep. You don't have, tri you don't have trouble falling asleep. Maybe you do a little bit, but you have trouble to stay in sleep. So you have this disruption in your sleep that you wake up and you fall asleep and you wake up, you fall asleep. It's really this disrupts your sleep pattern and affects your ability to function. You also have more anxiety or you have more likely to have anxiety. So if you have a medication that has shown to be effect, effective to treat depression, but also has some good data on hot flashes or anxiety or helps patients to sleep better. So that's you get two or three benefits by choosing that medication. The other thing that you have to keep in mind is estrogen, right? Estrogen will be effective for depression or depressive symptoms in the perimenopause or early postmenopause years, but not in postmenopause years. So there is a window of opportunity for you to use estrogen, which is not that much different than the, the estrogen, the window of risk, the critical window for cardiovascular benefits. So it's when women are transitioning to perimenopause or in the early postmenopause years. And why is that for mood? Well, if you remember that slide that we discussed the hormonal fluctuations, right? It's not about how much hormones you have, it's how chaotic the hormonal changes are. Women in their postmenopause years, when they are in the 70s or 80s, the estrogen levels are low, but they're constantly low. They are no longer fluctuating as much as they used to. So that trigger is no longer there. Therefore, the estrogen is less likely to work as well as it works in the perimenopause years. Because one thing that estrogen does is regulate that hormonal change into a more uniform way. So it does work as a antidepressant, but also works by reducing the hormonal changes. So it is more likely to work in the perimenopause years, in the first, I would say, five years after the perimenopause or the menopausal transition. So during the transition in the five years postmenopausal, then in the late postmenopause years. And then we have clinical trials that show that very, very elegantly that it does not work in postmenopause women. So if you have someone struggling with depression and perimenopause, having indication for estrogen because they're having hot flashes or night sweats, don't have any contraindications for estrogen, and they have depressive symptoms, that's the perfect population that you can try estrogen. And in some cases, you can try estrogen first. You can do a sequential uh, strategy. You can try estrogen first. The data suggests that using transdermal estradiol is better than using oral estrogen. So use transdermal estradiol, and then you can see the benefits for mood, quality of life, uh, depression. Within four to six weeks, you're going to be able to see if there is any benefits. And then in some cases, if they need antidepressants, they might need a lower dose of antidepressants because there is some synergistic effect between estrogen and antidepressants for that population as well. So I hope I answered the question about Perry versus Pulse. That's so helpful. And, and it's such an important distinction that we do need to make. So I really appreciate that. While we're talking about hormones, there was a question about the birth control pill or combined oral contraceptives. Are, you know, are those considered hormone therapy? And I think particularly, can you consider those if, when we've been talking about hormone in the treatment of uh, perimenopausal depression? Is there a role for the birth control pill or COC? There is. And then probably in, in the women who are actually, if you think about someone in their late 30s or early 40s or up to mid 40s, sometimes they are coming to see you as a primary care physician. Quite often they don't come to see me as a psychiatrist, but they come to see either gynecologist or 
primary care, they say, well, my cycles are getting regular, my PMS is getting worse, but I'm still having relatively uh, uh, regular cycles. Um, they're still menstruating quite often. So if you're probably gonna try to use hormonal therapy, which has much lower concentration of estrogen, you won't be able to suppress the hormonal changes that are happening, the ups and downs. So the first trial for that population, if they don't have any contraindications to use uh, oral contraceptives, would be to use uh, continuous OCs, right? To try to reduce the hormonal changes by using continuous OCs. In some cases, that's gonna be the treatment for them until they are in their late 40s, early 50s, where they probably are now finally entering the menopausal transition. Because remember, the, the transition from premenopausal to perimenopausal, it may last for years. And then the menopausal transition itself may also last for years. So some women might be symptomatic for a decade, right? And, and I know it sounds like scary to think about being symptomatic for a decade, but it happens, right? So it might be that for some younger women, using OCs is the first step. Uh, to regulate their cycles and to minimize the hormonal change and maybe with that improving their mood symptoms. And then as they transition later on to the menopause and become menopause or early postmenopausal, uh, that high concentration of estrogen or hormones that you have in the birth control pills, you might not need that. But switching then from that to a hormonal therapy as we used to call hormonal replacement therapy, but you know the menopausal hormonal therapy, might be the best option. So I would say yes for younger women, particularly for those who had some more PMS-like or PMS-related symptoms, they might benefit from, from birth control pills for sure. And just a reminder that if we do that, when we transition women from the birth control pill to hormone therapy, especially if they're perimenopausal, and so we haven't really established that there's been a final menstrual period and then a year of no period, which is how we define menopause, we just need to remember for our listeners that using hormone therapy itself is not a contraceptive. So when the additional benefits, particularly in that time with COCs, is you do get contraception. So when you do transition, you need to speak to your healthcare provider about your needs for uh, contraception. Um, there's some data that suggests if you have menopause in your 40s, you actually need contraception for two years after your final menstrual period. If you have menopause in your 50s, then it's only a year. But I think it's something I can tell you as a primary care doc, we're busy trying to deal with so many things, we often forget that. So that's, again, a good place where women can be good advocates for themselves. So um, I see we have some questions coming in. Um, maybe I'll just ask one last question, if we can. I mean, women are sometimes reluctant to seek care. Do you have any advice for them? or any recommendations for resources around menopausal care, particularly with relation to mood? Yeah, so that's, that's an important point because we might, you know, we are, we are preaching to the choir here, right? So we talk to people who are interested in, in learning about uh, menopause um, and found a way or a channel that they can actually uh, get information, but it's still pretty, pretty rough out there, right? So for, for patients to open up to their physicians or their, their clinicians about menopause, there's still a lot of stigma uh, around menopause and you know, pathologize the process is natural uh, or, or create some sort of um, conditions that could increase the stigma or potentially um, uh, affect women's ability to function well or be well uh, accepted in their work environments. There's a very interesting piece on New York Times this uh, past weekend about um, menopause and workplace, right? So workplace being friendly. So I think it's it's understandable that there's still reluctance for women to open up to physicians and clinicians in general, or anyone to talk about menopausal symptoms uh, and, and hear, you know, listen to comments back, oh, it's all in your head, or just wait, it's gonna pass, or being kind of, a, you know, not really valued or, or taken seriously. So that's still a, a challenge, but I, I I'm, I'm, I'm sad to say that it's still a problem among physicians as well. So physicians are not well informed and well trained to know what's happening in menopause. I think what a week in our curriculum and in medicine about the if. if <laughs> right? And if. I can tell you zero in the psychiatric uh, training that we don't get any training about mental health and menopause or 
women's mental health probably a little bit better, but not really specific to menopause. So it's a lot of a lack of information and understanding. So, and I think we are better than we were probably five to 10 years ago in general about depression in women or depression in general, right? So people are talking more about depression. So I think it's, it's not being afraid to really make that as a front center of your complaints. What usually happens is that you go to your family doctor, and I know it's the same thing in US and Canada. We don't have a lot of time with your family doctors. They're quite busy, right? And we have to pick and choose. We have to add to, you know, have one complaint or two complaints, the chief complaints that we're gonna to choose to talk about this time. And quite often, mood, sleep, anxiety, they get pushed down the list, right? And physicians, let's face it, sometimes are relieved that we don't raise those issues with them because it, they know it's gonna take a little bit longer <laughs> to address those things, to take about to talk about treatments and all the behavioral, psychological, hormonal factors. So it's gonna take time. So my first suggestion is that don't shy away from raising that with your physician and just acknowledge that it might take more time for them to say that. Say maybe in preparation for your your next consult with your primary care physician or your family doctor, say, I know that's gonna take time, but I really want to talk about my menopause and my mood symptoms. And if we don't exhaust the discussion today, maybe we can do it the next time, but just make it front and center as opposed to leave it at the by the way time of your counsel, right? Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that I have mood and because then it's not gonna be properly addressed and you're gonna be frustrated and you won't have time. So it's important to make it front and center in your discussion with your clinicians, but also being prepared for, for discussion. So there's a lot of information now um, I think we're getting better and having more accurate information presented to, to patients or community large. So we have, you know, your website, MQ6, we have, you know, Let's Talk Menopause, the NAMS have more information. Um, there is also a lot of noise out there, not a lot of information that's not accurate. So I would encourage people to really looking at um, different websites to get, uh, you know, more information. Those that I just mentioned, we know that they have, um, serious people behind. They're putting you know, content that is uh, accurate and it's uh, up to date. But getting the information, being prepared for that conversation with your primary care physician or your physician general uh, or your clinician, I think it's important. So save some time for that discussion, having that discussion is front and center of your consult, but also being prepared. Thank you for that. No, I, that should help people out there. It's really, it's a challenge. I can tell you in primary care in Canada, we're actually now told not to even ask uh, proactively about mood issues, which is why I came up with the MQ6, where at least we're encouraging physicians for midlife women to ask about mood and sleep, which is a perfect segue into, I think, an important question I, I did want us to cover, which is what is that interplay between mood and sleep for these perimenopausal menopausal women? Yeah, so that's so that's um, that's a chicken and egg question, right? So a lot of patients who are going through perimenopause and menopause, they they tell us, you know, um, I I am feeling unwell the next day because I couldn't sleep at night, right? So I have a lot of night sweats, so hot flashes. I had to wake up and go to the washroom many times or bathroom, uh, and I think that if I could sleep better, uh, my mood would be better. In some cases, that's true. So we do have patients that we can clearly see that the sleep problems emerge before the mood, and then sometimes they get better if the, the, the sleep get better, right? Uh, in some cases, those things are emerging at the same time. And in, to make it even more complicated, quite often when they have sleep problems, it's also related to hot flashes or night sweats. So, so it's not like you have this triad, you know, those three factors, sleep, hot flashes, and mood, they are interrelated clinically, but they also interrelated from the biological point of view. There's probably underlying conditions that are increasing your risk to have both, either two of three or sometimes three out of three, right? So for instance, we know that estrogen regulates serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, all those chemicals in your brain. And some of those chemicals are also regulating or modulating your sleep and modulating your mood and your behavior in general. So when one gets messed up, all the other ones get messed up as well together. But if you do have a patient that is clearly uh, developing hot flashes uh, and in the context of having severe hot flashes, they're not sleeping well. And in the context of not sleeping well, 
they are having mood symptoms. The natural sequence would be treating hot flashes and see how much the treated or treatment of hot flashes improves their sleep and then how much of that leads to improvement in mood, right? So, and we know that even now you have the new molecules being developed to, or new classes of, of medications. One of them is actually working neurokinine or, or NK1 and NK3 uh, receptors in your brain, not without going into too many details, but this is a new class of medication that has just been approved for in the US for hot flushes. Uh, there are others on the pipeline coming up in the next year or two, both in the US and Canada. So those molecules are working in your brain through a different mechanism to improve hot flashes. But the study is showing that they actually have a signal, a positive signal on sleep and maybe potentially mood. And it's not necessarily a domino effect or a cascade effect. They may have independent effects on sleep and mood than the effects that they have on hot flashes. So it could be that in some cases, medications are treating those different factors independently. In other cases, they are treating this, the hot flashes, and then by treating the hot flashes, patients sleep better, and by treating the sleep, the mood gets better. There are also studies showing that when women use, um, for a brief period of time, sleeping pills, even if they have hot flashes, they can sleep through them. And then by sleeping through them, the next day they function better. So we know that those things are interrelated. So I would say, try to isolate what are the most pressing symptoms that are bothering you. If they're mood symptoms, focus on that. But if the hot flashes of sleep are really there and they might have a domino effect on your mood, really focus on treating hot flashes in the sleep pills. And that's perfect because it really is the, the messy triad and we have to start somewhere. Just for yourselves and for the clinicians that when we're dealing with all of those, we have to remember that women in this group also, they can develop a structured sleep apnea as they age or if they've gained a lot of weight, they may have other sleep disorders. Um, sometimes the platter symptoms with the genital urinary syndrome and menopause get them waking up to pee three times, five times a night, and that just starts the cascade. And then it actually can add to the weight issue because we know that when women don't get a full night's sleep, that their body thinks they need more calories and the brain will overcompensate so that we overeat and then we get the joy of gaining some weight. I'm, I'm so happy you mentioned that because there's, as you said, a lot of the uh, sleep disorders, they're not related to menopause, but they can get worse and we shouldn't overlook them, right? Because a lot of women never had their sleep apnea treated, right? And then at that point in time, that might be the main cause where there's not a good time. Yeah. So lots to think about. So I love this question. I know you're going to love this one. Have there been data on ketamine and psychedelics with perimenopausal mood symptoms? That's oh, yeah. Okay. The old let's rage talk. now, right? So let's talk about ketamine and psychedelics. So uh, there's probably a lot of interest, as you know, about uh, the so-called psychedelics and including drugs like ketamine, which is not truly a true psychedelics, but it, it caused some dissociative states and it's kind of usually bun bundled together with psychedelics. So the data on ketamine, uh, either uh, ketamine infusion, so using IV ketamine or intranasal ketamine, uh, which is a S ketamine, which is spray, the data primarily uh, is for depression in general and is di a difficult to treat or treatment resistant depression, showing that ketamine has very significant and in some cases very uh, robust antidepressant effects and very fast, very fast onset of action. Uh, in some cases, ketamine infusion, a few sessions in a matter of days can revert a severe depression to non-depressed. And what's interesting, in some cases really alleviate almost immediately suicidal alleviation. And people don't know exactly the mechanism by which ketamine works so well in patients with suicidal ideation. But there are a lot of ongoing studies looking at ketamine in specific populations. There's one study that I'm aware of uh, that was done in Canada, uh, looking at a population of um, postmenopausal women, or not perimenopausal, but postmenopausal women uh, that had difficult to treat depression, and they showed a very good response to ketamine. But there are no studies that I'm aware of that look at ketamine specifically for perimenopausal depression. And for those that have depression primarily triggered by hormonal changes, it will probably not be uh, any, any unique or special treatment. 
because ketamine doesn't do anything for hormonal changes or hormonal fluctuations, but it might help treating depression for those who have more severe, difficult to treat depression that they are carrying on to their postmenopause years. So I would say for those that have been suffering from depression for a long period of time, and now they are perimenopausal or postmenopausal, they might have another additional reason or two to be depressed or to remain depressed. Both ketamine and psychedelics might become options. Psychedelics is still in the early stages of, the, of the trials. There are now ongoing trials in US and in Canada and Europe, um, sponsored by um, you know, NIH or Health Canada and Canada, European agencies. There's a lot of interest in psychedelics. I think they learn a lot from cannabis. For those who don't know, cannabis is illegal in Canada. Um, so there's a lot of interest in using cannabis for anxiety or depression. And we learned that in most cases, cannabis doesn't work well at all for anxiety or depression. But there is a lot of, a, a lot of a noise and a lot of a buzz about cannabis. So they're trying to avoid the same mistake with psychedelics and really doing well-designed studies, taking the time to, to, to try and test psychedelics or different psychedelics to see what works what works well and for whom, right? So I would say the jury is still out. There's nothing that would suggest us to go and try ketamine and psychedelics for perimenopausal depression before we try everything else that we discussed today that have very good data on. Um, that's the perfect answer. Um, and you're absolutely right. The data on cannabis, it's, very, it's interesting. It's The quality is not there. And it's no. reassuring to us as clinicians that they are being more stringent about the studies they're doing now. Um, I would say the only the only reasonable data that we have for cannabis for pain and nausea. Yeah. Everything else, when you look at the studies very carefully, whether it's for anxiety or depression, the, the signal is minimally different, if and different at all from placebo. So we know that uh, in most cases you're just getting the placebo effect or just a relaxing effect of a CBD, but it's really not treating depression or anxiety. Right. And, and I think just things an important point I just want to share is when you understand how these studies are done, studies are generally done because people volunteer. The interesting thing about cannabis is much of the population has tried cannabis when they are younger. So if they had a psychotic reaction or a really negative psychiatric reaction when they tried cannabis at 12 or 15, let's say, um, they're not volunteering for a study on cannabis in their 20s. So we do have, these studies are tainted by a, and I think that's an important thing for our listeners to remember when they feel that this is just such a safe thing to do, because that's an, that is an important fact, at least to me. So, so Susan, I'm looking at the, the chat here and someone uh, asked a question about uh, having a bad reaction to birth control pills in the past. Right. I was just going to ask that one. Yeah, yeah, so I think that's a very good point. So someone had a bad reaction to birth control pills in the past. The first question that I would ask is, what birth control pill did you use? So what was the estrogen they used or progesterone? What was the concentration? Was a, was a continuous combined? Was a monophasic pill or not? So there's a lot of the details on the type of estrogen, the type of progesterone that was used that, that might explain why some patients may have a... a not so good reaction to one birth control pill and try a second one and do well uh, or be more reluctant to try any hormonal uh, treatments at all but having a bad reaction to a birth control pill does not mean that you're not going to have a good reaction to uh, a patch or a gel of estradiol for many reasons the type of estrogen might be different the concentration the dosing might be very different and sometimes it's not the estrogen that's the bad guy, it's the progesterone. Maybe, maybe the progesterone that was in your pill that caused you to be more irritable or having dysphoria or having other side effects. And if you're using estrogen as a hormonal therapy in your 40s and 50s uh, or late 50s, the dosing might be different. You might be using progesterone in a different way. You might be using a different type of progesterone. These are all things that would make more likely to um, tolerate well the, the treatment that you actually did when you used birth control pill in the past. But I'm not a, I'm not an OB guy, I'm not a family doctor. I'm gonna ask Susan if she has anything else to talk about that. But you know, it's not apples and apples. Sometimes it's apples and oranges. Um, I think you covered that quite well. I, the issues are that birth control pills and the compounds we use in menopausal hormone therapy differ. So a lot, we use a lot of estradiol, 
um, which is E2 in menopausal hormone therapy, whether where birth control pills or ethanol estradiol, it's different uh, a little bit, and the progestogens are different. So um, we know the progestogens, as you say, can cause mood problems. The nice thing we didn't get to was that when we're doing menopausal hormone therapy, and if we use micronize, um, micronized progesterone, that can be sedating. So if we have patients who are having hot flashes and mood issues as well, that um, using the micronized progesterone can also help a bit with sleep. The flip side of that is if it causes too much dominance, they can use that vaginally. Um, and the, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the questions here while I'm talking to you. So there was a question about the use of transdermal estradiol, which I thought was important to hit was, which is that if you're going to use transdermal estradiol for mood, as a primary treatment of mood in perimenopause, most women have a uterus and therefore they need a progestogen along with that. So did you want to comment on that? Does do you choose one over the other? Does the progestogen, because they can affect the mood, um, yeah, so working contrary to the benefit of the estrogen. Yeah, so very briefly, so if they're using estradiol um, primarily for mood, uh, the study suggests that it could be at least 100 micrograms of estradiol to the gel or patch. So it's on the on the high end side of dosing. Sometimes you would use lower dosing for hot flashes, um, but you might need a relatively high dose of estrogen. So you're going to need to protect your endometrium. Uh, by using progesterone. The, the one that has been shown to be more neutral or even beneficial for mood is micronized progesterone, right? Uh, or prometrium, uh, because it doesn't cause more irritability or dysphoria like some other types of progesterone, but also has a sedating effect, sometimes help patients just be better. So usually women go on continuous combined, so they use the estrogen and progesterone, or they do cyclic progesterone, uh, the one that seems to be more positive for mood is actually continuous combined, like low dose of prometrium, sometimes 100, mic 100 micrograms every night, milligrams every night, and combined with estradiol. Um, but again, discuss with your doctors to, to figure out the best combination. And just Jessica, I saw your message about self-assessment for depression and anxiety. There are probably some tools that women can use to self-assess. I think the MQ6 that Susan developed and you put a link that uh, can be helpful for women to measure that. There's also very simple scales for mood. PHQ-9 is one of them, PHQ uh, um, number nine. And it's a very, it's a self, uh, self assessment scale, very, very user friendly, it takes less than a minute, and then can be helpful for you to bring that information to your clinician, your family doctor. So I just wanted to thank you both. This was incredibly informative. Um, and very important. We appreciate your time. We are happy we have you both as resources to Let's Talk Menopause now and con subsequently then to our audience. So we just wanted to thank you so much and we look forward to being able to connect with you in the future and draw on your enormous expertise.